uh, from National in Kabbalistan University of Athens. And well, I think that uh, he'll speak about the interior Calderon operator and the related technology aging problem for Maxwell equations. Okay, please go ahead. All right. Thank you. So uh, I would like first to thank uh, the organizers, Professor Alexei Karapetians and Professor Vladislav Kravchenko for the invitation. It's a, a big pleasure to participate in this uh, seminar. And I want to thank you all for being here. Uh, I, uh, one part of the audience that I saw before <laughs> putting the slides on are, are people that I know. So anyway, we will see each other in the end. So, OK, let me start. Uh, the title is the one that you see and the one that Professor Karpetians announced. And this representation is based on joint work with my colleague, uh, Pier Domenico Lamberti, in Padova, in Italy. And it's in a paper, most, uh, most of the results uh, are in a paper that uh, very recently appeared in the SIAM Journal of Mathematical Analysis. So let me uh, present in uh, just a, a synopsis of my talk. Uh, I will consider the cloth type problem for Maxwell's equations, which is related to an interior Calderon operator and with an appropriate uh, Dirichlet Neumann uh, type map. Uh, this map turns out to be compact and the so it provides a Fourier basis of the cloth eigenfunctions for the associated energy spaces. Uh, we use an approach similar to the one that was developed, developed, developed some year ago by Okmut, Okmuti for the Laplacian. And so we give a kind of a spectral, natural spectral representation for the trace spaces, the operator itself, the Calderon operator, and the solution of the corresponding boundary value problems with respect to different uh, appropriate different uh, conditions. So let me uh, let me begin with the uh, time harmonic Maxwell equations. We are considering a homogeneous isotropic non-conducting medium in, in R3, in a domain in R3. And so uh, assuming that we have uh, the time convention e to the minus i omega t, we get the time harmonic Maxwell equations that are equations 1.1. And because we consider homogeneous isotropic media, in our case, uh, epsilon and mi will be real constants. And as constants, uh, they, they uh, give the fact that the, the fields are divergence-free automatically. So we will consider uh, these equations, and uh, we consider also the so-called perfect conductor boundary condition which is n cross e is equal to m. That means that we are given the tangential trace of the electric field. So we have the system of equations 1, 1 plus the, uh, the boundary condition, the second equation in 1.2. So what is the, inter the interior Calderon operator? This is defined as the mapping from the, the tangential component of the electric field to the corresponding tangential component of the magnetic field. So it's the one that uh, goes, that takes M and maps it on N and on uh, knee cross H. Uh, so if we take the system of the two Maxwell equations and we operate by the operator curl and by introducing this new M, M tilde, we can take uh, uh, the equation 1, 3, which is only in terms of the uh, magnetic field. And so this is a second order equ equation. And the corresponding boundary condition becomes n cross, a uh, new cross uh, curl h is equal to m tilde. So the interior Calderon operator for this problem is the one that uh, maps m tilde to new cross h. Uh, and this problem, um, since we are working with divergence of fields uh, using this classical uh, vector identity, we can uh, uh, end up with the, the vector Helmholtz equation. 
for the magnetic field with this particular uh, boundary condition that arises from the perfect, uh, perfectly conducting boundary. So, uh, now with just a remark about uh, metamaterials. The equations I wrote before are for are the typical equations when epsilon and mu are positive, and so, for example, the dielectrics. But uh, there has been a lot, a lot of work on the so-called metamaterials that are materials that usually are not or they are never found in nature and they are constructed, but they are physically realizable and they correspond to different signs of epsilon and mi. For example, when epsilon and mi are both negative, we have the so-called left-handed materials. When epsilon is positive and mi is negative, we have the so-called sp split ring resonators. And when both epsilon, uh, uh, when epsilon is negative and mu is positive, we have the thin wire structure. So all these three, apart the first, which is the classical, let's say the classical materials, the dielectrics, so the, the other three uh, cases are included in the so-called metamaterials. And uh, so the results that I'm going to present cover all non-conducting metamaterials. Uh, and this will be seen because our coefficient uh, alpha that corresponds to the physical constant omega square epsilon mi, uh, can be of any sign, so we can cover these cases. Uh, okay, so just a couple of words about Calderon. He was a, a very important uh, mathematician, very, very important mathematician. He lived from 1920 to 1998. And uh, it is impressive the, the width of his uh, work because from very abstract fields like harmonic analysis, then passing to PDEs, to complex analysis, geometry, but much more, uh, let's say, applied and concrete applied areas like signal physics and tomography. So, uh, let me make a short uh, remark about the operator that already appeared in our problem, which is the operator curl curl, the double curl or the double curl minus rho square. Uh, this is a, a very important operator, operator in electromagnetic mathematical theory, but not only. For example, if one works with superconductors or with magnetohydrodynamics, uh, then these are the main or even standard operators in this, in this theory. So it is important to know uh, more to know a lot of their properties, uh, not only for electromagnetics, and this has been done by many people as well. So let me uh, speak about the classical Steklov eigen problem. Uh, the classical Steklov eigen problem, in general, in uh, bounded smooth domain in Rn, is the following problem: is the there is we look for a harmonic function in omega such that the the normal derivative d uh, sub, uh, subscript ni denotes the normal derivative uh, is equal to lambda to lambda which is a parameter non-negative real uh, which is called the eigen value so this is a problem it is a kind of a, a, a problem where let's say the, the eigen value appears on the boundary condition uh, the Steklov eigenvalues can be equivalently defined as the eigenvalues of the Dirichlet to Neumann map from h a half of the boundary to h minus a half of the boundary by g mapping to the normal derivative of v and v being a solution of the classical Dirichlet problem, uh, a harmonic function with uh, with boundary with boundary behavior g. So uh, what is uh, an interesting property is that the non-zero eigenvalues of the Dirichlet Neumann operator are the reciprocals of the eigenvalues of the corresponding Neumann to Dirichlet operator. Uh, and these eigenvalues have finite multiplicity and can be represented as a non-decreasing divergent sequence. Now, uh, this kind of boundary spectral parameters were introduced in 1902 by Steklov. 
there are many, many examples and models of uh, such kind of problems. For example, in linear surface water waves, in mechanical oscillators immersed in a viscous fluid, vibration modes in different structures, heat diffusion, optimal design, geophysical imaging, medical imaging, and as well as in inverse scattering theory uh, for the reconstruction of the index of refraction. Uh, one can see many, um, uh, a number of interesting references about this kind of stack of problems in this paper that I uh, refer by Lamberti and Provenzano. Uh, there, there is extended uh, numerical study for stack of eigenvalue problems. And there is a very interesting, rather, rather recent application of the Steklov eigen problem in a work by uh, two, two, two scientists, Hayden and Ortiz. And this is on the functional optimality of the Sulcus pattern of the human brain. So it's in a very different field than the ones that I suppose the majority of us are uh, familiar with. And nevertheless, it, there appears a, a typical Steklov eigen problem there. Now, um, maybe with uh, with the audience of today, I should not mention, I should not say much about Steklov, but uh, in the in the, let's say the, the Western audience, although the name is uh, very well known, it's not much is well known about uh, Steklov. So he was not only an outstanding mathematician, but uh, he was a very bright personality. Uh, there's a very interesting uh, paper about his life uh, and work. Uh, so I'm not reading to you all the names of the authors, but it's called The, the Legacy of Vladimir Andreevich Steklov. I will just say a couple of uh, points about, about Steklov. Uh, his master's thesis was on, uh, on the equations of a solid body moving in an ideal non-viscous fluid. In this problem, there were four cases to be studied. Um, two of them were, were already solved by Klebs. And Steklov solved the third case as a master student in 1893. And in the same year, the final case was solved by Yapunov, who was Steklov's supervisor. Uh, then he moved on for his doctoral dissertation on problems that arose in potential theory, electrostatics, and hydromechanics using rigorous mathematical analysis. Uh, after his doctorate, he studied boundary value problems of Dirichlet type, where uh, the Laplacian, the Laplacian must be solved on the surface. He wrote a very important, uh, he, had a, he, he did very important work on the so-called general theory of fundamental functions, in which he examined expansions of functions as series in an infinite system of orthogonal Lagrange functions. And uh, by the way, the term fundamental functions is due to Poincaré, and at that time it meant what we call today eigenfunctions. And he also, uh, Stoklov worked also on hydrodynamics and the theory of elasticity, and he also wrote a number of works on the history of science. He was an invited speaker on the International Congress of Mathematicians in 1924 in Toronto. Uh, all right. So, uh, it is quite interesting to say some uh, introductory, I would say, words uh, on a topic that I'm not working on, but it's very important. Uh, so, let's say a couple of words about the Steklov spectrum and geometric spectral theory. So, if, if we have a compact Riemannian manifold and uh, uh, with a non-smooth, not necessarily smooth boundary, the Steklov problem is uh, is stated in the same way. Uh, now, uh, delta, capital delta, is the Laplace Beltrami operator. Uh, and the outward normal derivative along the boundary is uh, D uh, subscript Ni. And it is known that the spectrum in this case is discrete as long as the trace operator from H1 of omega to L2 of the boundary of, of M, or of M, not on the of M, which is the boundary of omega is compact. So the eigenvalues form a, a sequence, the divergent sequence, and the corresponding eigenfunctions form an orthonormal basis. Uh, for example, when uh, omega is the unit ball in R3, 
the eigenvalues are one, uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. The multiplicity of each lambda j is equal to 2j plus 1, and the corresponding eigenfunction is the solution of the last equation in this slide. The uh, delta on the sphere uh, plus j times j plus 1 uh, phi j is equal to 0. So, uh, so the Steklov eigenfunctions can be interpreted as eigenvalues of the Dirichlet to Neumann operator. So uh, as statements, these results are exactly the same as for the simple, let's say, the problem I mentioned before. And in this case, the Dirichlet to Neumann operator maps a function on h a half of m to the normal uh, derivative of the harmonic extension of the function. Uh, so there are many, many interactions between geometry and spectral theory, and there are phenomena that uh, do not appear in other eigenvalue problems. So it is uh, maybe interesting to know that, uh, to remark that uh, often mathematical notions are independent of the intentions of their creators, they have their own life. And nobody, I suppose, knows that when he introduced, Steklov introduced the eigenvalue problem, uh, which was, as I mentioned, motivated by applications. Uh, if he had in mind or he could foresee any of the, of this, let's say, geometric spectral theory, very, very modern geometric spe spectral theory con considerations. There's this very nice paper by Giroir and Polterovic that uh, of a couple of years ago about such, such ideas. Now, uh, before moving to electromagnetics, a uh, final remark about the Steklov spectrum and shape optimization. So, uh, as we know, if one considers the faber kran inequality, this states that among uh, all uh, Euclidean domains with fixed measure, the first Dirichlet eigenvalue is minimized by a ball. Now, this is for Dirichlet eigenvalues. If we consider uh, Neumann eigenvalues, uh, we have that the first non-zero eigenvalue is maximized by a ball, and this is given by the sergei Weinberger inequality. And both of these results uh, assume no topological uh, hypothesis. The, the reason analogous result for the Steklov eigenvalues is the so-called Weinstock inequality. This states that among planar domains with fixed perimeter, the first eigenvalue is maximized by a disk, but not always, provided that omega is simply connected. And this is a crucial uh, assumption, and it is uh, proved, for example, that it has been proved, for example, that for appropriate annually, this result fails, so when the simple connectedness is not any longer uh, valid, uh, the result is, does not hold. And which another uh, another comment is that the asymptotic distribution of the Clough eigenvalues uh, is very sensitive to the regularity of the boundary, uh, unusually sensitive, I would say. All right. Now, uh, our final remark is there is a, a, a paper by Meyer and Kratzetnikov on the dynamics of liquid slossing. And OK, this is how how coffee, for example, and not only is uh, gets out of the cup as we walk. And OK, after a study, one ends up with the problem for the velocity potential, which is the first one, the Laplacian is zero inside the cup. On the free surface, we have this blue boundary condition. And on the sides and the bottom, we have, let's say, Neumann conditions. And if we separate variables, uh, this leads to, uh, uh, to trying to find a harmonic function inside the cup, to have the Neumann condition on the sides and the bottom, and on the free surface to have this in, in, uh, in uh, Magenta, which is the equation in Magenta, the boundary condition, which is on the free surface, which is a clearly a Steklov type condition. So even in this everyday <laughs> problem, there, there appears the Steklov eigen problem. Now, 
so as I mentioned, there are many classes of operators uh, in different, very different fields that have been studied in terms or in view of the Stoklov type uh, spectrum. Uh, nevertheless, th the same does not uh, hold for Maxwell's equations. Uh, Maxwell's equations, as it is known, they present a number of uh, difficulties uh, in relation, for example, to their scalar counterpart, which could be uh, the Helmholtz equation. And so all for, Ma for the Helmholtz equation, there has been done for Maxwell, for uh, the Stoklov problem, but not that much for Maxwell's equation. There, has, there are some exceptions uh, very recently. Uh, there, are, uh, there are two papers, important papers, by Sam Koger. Co Sam Koger is a very young guy, I think a promising mathematician, a student by Colton and Monk. And I think it's the first student that Colton and Monk have had uh, together. I had uh, many students individually, but I think Koger is the first one that they had together. Mm -hmm. And the other one, the other paper is by uh, Jessica Camagno, uh, Lackner and Monk. So in the first paper, they use the Stekloff eigenvalues. By the way, they spell Stekloff not with a V in the end, by, but with double F. And in the first of these papers, the, they use the, the Stekloff eigenvalues to detect changes in the scatterer. So it is a typical problem of a scattering problem. And in fact, they use the eigenvalues as a, a completely new type, a novel type of target signature for uh, having testing, non-destructive te te uh, testing via inverse scattering. Now, uh, the Stoklov eigenvalue problem for Maxwell's equations, one of the differences that I mentioned that there exist before, is uh, it's, it, it is not a standard eigenvalue problem for a compact operator. So they had to, to modify it and propose an, a, another modified problem, not the standard one in a sense, that restores, restores compactness. Uh, so uh, in order to, to do what they try to do, to, to measure these modified stack log functions from the far field, uh, they perturb it and they use the, the linear sampling method, this method that is already for, for, for maybe 30 years old, and they use, to use the far field pattern uh, and uh, auxiliary problem to, to study the modified Stekloff problem. Now, uh, they, the boundary condition that they, they use it is a scattering problem, okay? So it is a, a, a exterior boundary value problem. The boundary condition that they use is the, this one, the first one in Magenta, which is Ni cross curl U is equal to lambda uh, times UT. Now UT is the tangential component of U. Uh, so it is, it, the modification goes there. It's not, uh, Ni cross curl u is equal to lambda u, but to lambda ut. And the, they use the, the energy space they use is the, the space of uh, fields in H curl u, whose uh, direction, whose tangential component is in L2. And, and so the corresponding eigenvectors turn out to be divergent free and they can go on. In the problem that I will mention very shortly, the one that we study, uh, we have, let's say, the, the natural boundary condition. So it is Ni cross curl U is equal to uh, lambda U. Our problem is an interior problem. Uh, uh, this condition is stronger in the sense that our eigenfunctions are automatically tangential uh, because of this uh, condition. So uh, in general, there appear two, let's say, parts of the spectrum one that goes to, to zero and the other one that goes to minus infinity. And considering uh, this kind of eigenfunctions, as we do, this uh, discards the, the, the bad part, let's say, the one that goes to minus infinity. And uh, so uh, this is a, a, a difference. And 
we use a different uh, energy space than they do, and this is the space that you see in the end of the slide, but we will come back to that, so I don't take any time to speak about the, the space, the energy, our energy space now. So, uh, there is uh, even a much more recent work, a good part of it is not yet published, but it is in archive. There's by a young guy who is called Martin Halla, and he, in two very technical but very, very good mathematical papers, he studies the original Steklov eigenvalue problem for Maxwell's equations, both for the, let's say, the the original, both the original and the, the modified Steklov problem, the ones by Monk and the other guys, the other people, and studies the Fredholmness and approximation properties. And he shows, among others, that the essential spectrum does not consi uh, consist only of the point zero, and that the eigenvalues are discrete in C minus zero in the complex field. And he also shows that infinitely many eigenvalues exist, when all of the coefficients are real valued. Uh, and apart from this uh, very recent work, there is all, uh, also very recent interesting work by Kogar, one of the, th this uh, former student of Colton and Monk that I mentioned before. And he has done very recently very nice work on existence and stability of electromagnetic eigenvalues, uh, Steklov eigenvalues. Uh, and to do that, he considers an, uh, a modification of the initial operator, uh, a modification in in uh, in the sense of a, of a trace class. So he considers a, a modified operator, which is trace class operator, and then he uh, up till now he has considered the case of uh, me is equal to one. So appearing only one, let's say only epsilon, not the me is always fixed. But nevertheless, in this case, that I'm sure that he will improve soon, uh, he surpasses the, the fact that in, in the for Steklov eigenvalues, if the permittivity is not real or not smooth, uh, there are no results for existence. So he surpasses that with this new interesting idea of trace class uh, modified operator. Right. So, uh, as I mentioned, the Calderon, oh, maybe I didn't mention the Calderon operator, uh, is studied up to now extensively in electromagnetics. Uh, many examples can be found in the classical book by uh, Michel Cessna. Uh, recently, and some of you have uh, listened to me talking on that, uh, for example, last, uh, last September of uh, of 2019 in Batum, uh, and earlier again in Rostov. Uh, there is a, a, a representation of the exterior Calderon operator, and uh, not for necessarily spherical domains, which is, it, 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 it's done by Gerhard Christensen, Niklas Velander, Thanasi Yanakopoulos and me. And uh, so I'm not going to say any more because time is passing. And so we we get a kind of a of a serious expansion with respect to the introduced general generalized harmonics, and we we express the the norm of the exterior Calderon operator in view of an eigen problem, which is very sim uh, similar to a Steklov eigen problem. All right, so, so this is the problem that I mentioned uh, again in the beginning. So I'm passing now to our work with Lamberti. And so is this the problem that I, I spoke about in the beginning? Uh, we need some function spaces. They are standard in electromagnetics, so I'm not going to stay in this, uh, in this uh, uh, frame more, much more uh, and so I've written them down just to be cons to be complete let's say for sake of completeness now in, in this part of the talk and so on the work that we did uh, with uh, Pierre Domenico Lamberti uh, we consider throughout that Omega 
is a bounded connected open set with a C11 boundary. Uh, some of the results can we can do with uh, okay not not C11 but with let's say worse boundary but not all of them so we stick to this case that everything works fine. Uh, so uh, we I already mentioned that if we uh, operate with curl on the previous problem, we get uh, the associated problem, which is 2-2 two, two, without the grad div uh, term. This is a new term that appears now. Uh, uh, for example, when theta is uh, zero, the, the, this problem, 2-2 the two, two for theta is equal to zero, is the, the uh, interior Calderon problem that uh, I already mentioned. Uh, in 2-2, there is a, a one term that uh, we can call a penalty term, which is theta times grad of the divergence of u with theta positive. This is introduced to guarantee the coercivity of the quadratic form, which is associated to the Calderon operator. And uh, just let me make a, uh, a remark that the, the boundary operator, we, it appears in 2.2, two, uh, is, let's say, uh, we can be can be considered as the electromagnetic version of the operator uh, uh, d uh, ni u d ni as you recall is the, the normal derivative operator uh, on the boundary, uh, the corresponding operator to the Laplacian to the scalar scale of Laplacian. All right, so. So the interior Calderon operator is defined as this, where u is the solution of this problem of the problem with the penalty term. Uh, so there is a one-to-one -one, uh, uh, correspondence between the electric and magnetic fields like that. In in the problem in that I mentioned that I mentioned before, the corresponding to the Dirich, Dirich, uh, Neumann to Dirichlet map is Ni cra, uh, cross curl maps to U. And the eigenvalues of this problem are the reciprocals of the eigenvalues of the Steklov type problem for Maxwell's equation of this one. Now, uh, okay, we, we, we consider this problem in weak sense. And, uh, okay. Now, since uh, uh, there exists the so-called uh, very important uh, Gaffney inequality that uh, is the one that it's written in the uh, in the footnote here and uh, in the case that uh, the that's why I made this assumption before in the case that the boundary is C11 and there is uh, it's known that uh, by this inequality it follows that uh, the, the embedding of L2 uh, of uh, sorry of uh, x t uh, is uh, con continuous in h1 and it is compact in l2. Let me recall just for a moment that x t is uh, this space here, so it is the space h curl uh, intersected by h zero div. H curl is the classical electromagnetic space. H zero div is the other classical electromagnetic space, but with uh, certain behavior on the boundary, which is uh, this. So X T, this is a symbol used by many years ago, uh, is this space. Under the, our assumption, X T becomes this space now. Uh, U is in H1. The fields in H1 such that uh, u dot n uh, dot ni is zero. All right, so uh, we are going to use some of the properties of the so-called tangential component trace, this p subscript t of w, which I list here. And so let's let's go on to consider the solvability of these problems. You recall the problems. The one was the the problem two two which is this one right and the uh, problem two four is the is the the, eigen, the corresponding eigen eigenvalue uh, problem the eigenvalue problem uh, 
Right, so, okay, there's a number of steps. I'm not going to give many details. I will skip some or go very fast through some of the, of the, of the slides. So, uh, for a, a sufficiently large eta, uh, we consider this boundary condition. And the first thing is to establish that this problem has a unique solution for every f in the tangential L2 boundary space. Now, uh, now we, we, from the beginning, we get across the following problem. Uh, when alpha is uh, positive, you recall that I mentioned that I'm going to discuss not only positive alpha, but negative uh, alpha as well. Uh, so for positive alpha, uh, there, is, there are some complications in the problem because the, 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 the quadratic form in the left hand side of this, this quadratic form here, is not necessarily positive definite. So uh, we uh, consider this assumption in blue that alpha, this coefficient, is smaller than capital, capital A1, where A1 is uh, the infimum of, of this uh, quantity, 2 8. Now, uh, it, follows by, it follows that A1 is positive and that A1 is the first eigenvalue of this problem, of problem 2, 9. And so we will consider this case first. And the case, in the case that uh, alpha is greater than A1, I will make a couple of remarks in the end, but we have treated this case as well. So the first uh, main result is that if alpha is less than A1 and theta is positive, there exists uh, a, a non-negative constant such that for any eta, you recall that I mentioned that eta is sufficiently large, the quadratic form defined by 2,7 is coercive. And so problem 2,7 uh, problem has a unique solution. 2,7 is this problem, the, the final here. It, so it has a unique solution in this space, xt, for, for all f in TL, uh, TL2. Now, if alpha is uh, non-positive, then one can take this constant to be zero. And for alpha non-positive and eta is equal to zero, and if f is divergence-free, but f, you recall, is just uh, uh, on, on the boundary, so it's, this is the boundary divergent, the div uh, subscript gamma, then if it is, let's say, uh, boundary, if it is divergence-free on the boundary, it is divergence-free everywhere. And OK, and uh, this last problem can be as well formulated in, in a different uh, energy space. But OK, this is just a remark. That it's okay. Now, uh, we, move, we move on. Now we have the solvability. We move on to this to just we, we want to go to spectral properties. So before we need to introduce uh, so-called resolvent operators. Uh, so we are in the case, as I mentioned, uh, until the last two, two frames, we will be in the case alpha smaller than A1, theta positive, and uh, eta bigger or equal to C alpha theta. So we introduce this operator uh, calligraphic L of eta alpha and theta from xt to its dual, and this is defined by this pairing here. And we consider a first operator, a calligraphic J, uh, that is given by this, uh, by this relationship for all f uh, in TL2 and, TL and for phi in xt. So we have introduced the uh, operators L and J. And from the uh, existence, uh, from the Solvability result we had before. Uh, this L eta alpha theta become, uh, is pro can be proved to be invertible. And so we can uh, introduce the operator alpha, calligraphic alpha, uh, calligraphic A, sorry, uh, gamma, gamma eta, like that. It is, uh, uh, I, we recall that P subscript T is the, this. Uh, boundary, this uh, trace operator. 
So it is it is invertible. So this medium term exists. So it is this combination, let's say. And one can prove that this operator is compact and self-adjoint. And uh, another, uh, okay, this, all right, it should not be here because I have not yet introduced the other operator. All right, so uh, if we define the sesquilinear form like that, uh, and uh, this uh, de uh, defines in the case we are interested, the uh, scalar product. And in view of this, the problem we are interested in can be written in this form, in the last equation here. So, we can consider uh, an operator alpha a, a omega eta now, that is uh, defined like that. And the, the relationship between these two operators were mi uh, mistakenly put it here. It's 215, I should move it to to here. Okay, but uh, this operator as well is compact and self-adjoint with respect to the inner product. So we return to this problem, to four, I'm repeating it here. Uh, this is the weak formulation. And so we can restate, let's say, this problem as, uh, as an eigenvalue problem for the, for the operator alpha gamma, a gamma eta. And we have the following result. In the case that we are interested, the spectrum of A omega eta can be represented as the union of zero uh, and the set of gamma ni, where gamma ni are negative eigenvalues of finite multiplicity that go to zero as n goes to infinity. And zero is an eigenvalue of infinite multiplicity with eigenspace given by all this space. And the point, the point spectrum of alpha of a gamma eta is given by gamma ni. So this is what gamma ni is. And uh, if we have this, let's say, well, kind of spectral equation, uh, then uh, we get this uh, this result that alpha gamma uh, are operating on PT of u is gamma ni. Uh, operating on PT of U. Now, uh, we also have a kind of, let's say, variational characterization of the eigenvalues. So, the, these eigenvalues are given by the reciprocal of gamma ni, the ones I spoke before, plus eta. And uh, they can be represented in this min max characterization. And uh, okay, with the standard standard assumption that its eigenvalue is repeated as many times as its uh, algebraic multiplicity, so we have this minimax characterization of the eigenvalues. Uh, now, uh, if we use, let's say, all the previous uh, machinery. We can see that uh, our space, our energy space, can be decomposed under, as an orthogonal sum, which is written here. So it is written as an orthogonal sum of the kernel of A omega eta and its, uh, okay, its, uh, its uh, orthogonal com complement, which is the same as, as we noticed before, as H1. Uh, the fields in H1 to the third, uh, O plus uh, the, this uh, orthogonal complement of the kernel. Now, uh, we want to know about uh, what happens with this. So, uh, we can see that U belongs here, uh, if and only if this, uh, this holds, 22, and this means that uh, uh, u belongs in this uh, orthogonal complement of the kernel, if and only if u is a weak solution of this problem. And then we can write this decomposition in the form of 224, having introduced the notation, the previous notation. Uh, the, this notation, the, uh, no, this notation, these functions play the same role that the harmonic functions play in the in the, this paper by 
Aukmuti that I mentioned for the scalar Laplacian. So uh, we go on to characterize somehow the interior Calderon operator in terms of the of the Stoklov spectrum. So le, uh, we consider uh, we uh, let sigma be this set, the set of Stoklov eigenvalues, and so the first result we have is that for the usual case that we consider of alpha and theta, this problem is uniquely solvable for every f in TL2, if and only if lambda is not a uh, Stoklov eigenvalue. Uh, and then we can uh, define, say, the interior Calderon operator as the operator that takes uh, a, a, a vector field on TL, uh, TL square of gamma and maps it on Ni cross U, where U is the solution of this problem. This is the problem, the initial problem with the penalty term, as you recall. So we can de define now precisely the interior Calderon operator like that. And let me make a couple of uh, remarks about the condition. What means that the condition that zero is not in the in the uh, spectrum in sigma? So this can be uh, described a bit better by noticing that if we consider the problem 229, which is the typical eigenvalue problem for the Laplacian with Neumann condition. Uh, this has a divergent sequence lambda eta, uh, uh, lambda, uh, sorry, lambda n, uh, capital N, which is, go, uh, is due to Neumann. Okay. And if we consider now the corresponding problem for the curl curl operator, right, with the, with the condition that we assume, and this condition is the so-called magnetic boundary condition. Uh, this uh, admits so as well a divergent sequence now denoted by lambda n superscript m, okay, for magnetic. So uh, n is for Neumann and m is for magnetic. The first operator is minus uh, Laplacian, the other operator is the double curl. And there is an interesting recent paper by Zhang that uh, is where the, the relationship between this problem 230 and the problem for Maxwell uh, system is uh, given, is studied. So uh, we consider uh, our problem 24, but in the, now consider lambda is equal to zero because we were making the marks in this case. And so we have the, the following theorem that this problem up here has a non-trivial solution in the energy space if and only if alpha is a theta multiple of the uh, eigenvalues of the Neumann eigenvalues, let's say, uh, is in this set of a theta multiples of lambda ni and the uh, eigenvalues of the of the other problem of the magnetic let's say, problem. Uh, by the way, the, there is a, this, this uh, penalty term business was introduced uh, years ago by Martin Kostabel. And they have, he with uh, Monique Doz have a number of very interesting papers on uh, electromagnetics, elasticity, etc. And so the, the uh, this uh, let's say magnetic boundary condition can be considered as a magnetic ver version of their condition of their theorem. All right, now, so let's go to the, let's say, uh, the main, main part of the work, which are the spectral, spectral representations. We are always in the case, uh, considered case, about alpha and theta. So, uh, we uh, we consider the the space calligraphic H of, of omega, which is a closed subspace, and this has a, a Hilbert basis of Stoklov eigenfunctions that satisfy 233. 
we are at 233 in terms of this, I would say. Uh, in this terminology, in this symbolism. And we consider uh, normalized eigenfunctions. Right? We normalize them. And, and uh, we set u gamma n to be the square root of the modulus of lambda n minus eta, uh, multiplied by the projection, let's say, the, the, not the projection, the tangential, the corresponding ten, tangential part of u n of omega. So well, this is an orthonormal basis of TLW. And so, uh, OK, let's, we have this theorem then that if, if zero is not in the, in sigma, then every f in TL2 of the boundary can be represented like that as this series where Cn is in little l2, and uh, sequence in little l2, and u and gamma are the ones that were introduced before. And okay, this is the representation, let's say, of any f, and the solution of uh, the problem we considered, of problem, our problem, initial problem, is given in, in this term. So uh, there appears this new, uh, there appear these new coefficients that are given in terms of lambda n and of this cn that was in the previous uh, representation. And okay, so we have, if f is represented like that, we can represent in a um, convenient ma uh, manner u, the solution of the problem, and the corresponding interior Calderon operator can be is uh, given just by knee cross this uh, with series. Now, uh, so this is done for TNL2, but uh, we will see shortly that this can be done as well for F in TH minus a half. So we can extend the Calderon operator as an operator from T H minus a half to T a half, H a half. So uh, we first define this uh, T calligraphic eight, uh, HS to be the, the, the set of, uh, of elements for S positive of elements that have this kind of decomposition and the corresponding norm is this one here. And the, this is T calligraphic eight and T calligraphic eight to the minus S is the dual of this. Uh, and the following theorem uh, we'll see in a couple of minutes uh, will uh, show us that uh, these uh, calligraphic H S S spaces, in the case of uh, S is equal to a half and minus a half, are just the classical T H normal H now, not calligraphic, a half and T H minus a half. Uh, so T H minus T calligraphic eight minus S can be identified with a space of sequences, this in particular space. And so uh, what we're going to get is we are going to get by the following theorem that we have, uh, we will have a, uh, a characterization of the space T calligraphic eight and a half and of the solutions of these two problems. You see, the first is with uh, uh, a kind of, I would say, Dirichlet condition, and the other is a combination of these two boundary conditions. And right, so this is uh, an, another of the main results: is that first that the image of the trace operator uh, is given by T calligraphic H to minus a half. Uh, the second is that if we have uh, this representation that we saw before, uh, then the solution can be represented like that. And the third part is that uh, if f now is not in, uh, is again as in uh, in uh, number two, in t h a half, a t calligraphic h a half, and if f cross knee is uh, represented by uh, this formula, where again we assume this kind of uh, convergence of the sequence, then the solution can be 
as well uh, given in terms of, of these coefficients as uh, the expansion in this series 251. And right, so. Uh, so we can uh, we can uh, replace the the F that was in, in the beginning in our definition in T in uh, L2. And uh, in, in L uh, in L two uh, of gamma in L uh, sorry in T eight yeah in L two of gamma we can uh, uh, replace it by such an F now in T calligraphic H minus a half and so it is well defined and we go on to this uh, final theorem that if zero is not in that spectrum sigma. And if f is represented like in 254, then the solution of our problem is uh, of the previous problem of the first of this problem, 252, yeah, which is written in that in this formulation. Uh, so sorry, uh, this is uh, can be the solution can be re represented in this uh, form where now the corresponding basis is u omega. Okay. I have a, a, some a remark, but I will skip it now about the possibility of, uh, although originally the bases are not, uh, are complex, we can work only with real ones, but let's forget it. And so we have uh, uh, the, the extension of the definition uh, from TL2 to T calligraphic H minus a half by defining the uh, uh, interior Calderon operator like that. And so this is, uh, uh, this solves the problem in the case that we were considering so far that alpha was smaller than A1, this uh, first eigenvalue. So let me uh, give uh, just uh, a very short, short, comment about the case alpha greater than a1. So, uh, all right. So, uh, in the in this case, uh, we consider the, the problem written here, uh, first problem, let's say, in this, in this frame. And this uh, has a divergent sequence of positive eigenvalues with finite multiplicity. So we we take alpha, which in this case now we are uh, we are in uh, in the case of not a but alpha greater uh, than uh, a one. Okay, we in this case uh, let's assume that alpha is between two subsequent uh, eigenvalues a n and a n plus one, and we consider corresponding subspace generated by all eigenfunctions with all eigenvalues smaller than n and we and we take its uh, orthogonal complement in this sense and we uh, this is our last result so we have a kind of a corresponding statement therefore all the theory can work in this case as well that if we are in the case that alpha is between two consecutive eigenvalues a a n and a n plus one. Then the, the energy space can be decomposed in this uh, matter, and there exists a non-negative, uh, non-negative constant such that for any sufficiently large eta, this quadratic form is coercive, and therefore all the results that we had before pass to the case of alpha not being necessarily less than a one, but for any alpha. And so, okay, uh, I took a whole hour. So this is the end, and thank you for your attention. And well, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Tragis, for your very nice talk. And are there any questions, please?
Okay, Alexei, questions? If, if there are no questions, can I ask you maybe? Okay, okay, go ahead, please. Go ahead. Because, yes, it, yeah. it was difficult for me to follow, Professor Stratis. So some uh, trivial questions maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, if we, uh, sorry, my, my question is, if we, if we have uh, the uh, Laplace operator, Yes. In this saying on, on, on boundary domain or in exterior domain with compact uh, boundary, uh, this <coughs> directly to Neumann map is just uh, first for the pseudo, pseudo differential operator. Yeah. And the it's asymptotic uh, is uh, more or less trivial, and uh, the behavior of uh, eigenvalues is well known. And uh, in your case, when you can see the, this uh, Maxwell operator, and in this case, uh, this Dirichlet Neumann map is, uh, is a matrix operator. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I don't know what is known about um, uh, this mixed order operator and what is the asymptotic behavior of uh, this operator. I mean, as, as a matrix pseudo differential operator on the boundary. No, uh, about about the in the setting you mentioned, uh, I think that not everything has been studied for that uh, in in this setting. There are some results, but uh, considering, let's say, the, the the problem in okay in a, a, a less uh, rigorous setting, I I could say, and there are some results about the asymptotic uh, behavior there. But for the specific uh, for the specific operator, in I would say the the rigorous setting as you mentioned in the pseudo differential uh, uh, I would say so, uh, operator uh, setting, I, I don't know. I I, I think I think uh, that I have not seen the corresponding results written. It, it okay. is most it is most probably that they may exist. But I, I cannot tell you where. <laughs> so, uh, because I, I think that uh, what your question already implies is that it should be, it, it could be, it should be known, or it could be known at least. And I believe so, but I yeah. don't know. Okay, but in in your considerations, it's in fact it is really very uh, not convenient for me that I, I could not ask questions uh, during your talk because uh, I don't remember what appeared on the first, second, and other other slides. Uh, but at one slide, uh, it is appeared uh, the the space which is as far as I remember h one uh, to the q, so direct sum of uh, mm -hmm. first sobolev space. And the plus h h uh, of omega without uh, without super index uh, or sub index, and uh, and you can see the your operator. This is uh, this is uh, like um, uh, directly to name and map uh, on this space, or it's. Uh, no, 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 no. This this was direct sum. Di direct sum. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Could you please explain in a few words? Uh, is it really um, natural space for considerations for the domain of this operator, yeah, or let, it is? Let Let me please uh, go to the presentation. And. Here you mean? No, no, it was it was direct sum, but uh, ah, okay. Yeah. Uh, here in this. Yeah, maybe maybe. Oh, this one. Previous slide. Ah, yeah, okay. Oh, previous slide. Previous slide. Ah, no, 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 no. No, maybe this one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, okay, well, uh, 224. This is your main space. Yes, X, XT is the main space. Yes, XT, XT of Omega. Yes? Yes. 
uh, OK, XT of Omega is the main space, and this is introduced. This is this space. So it's the space of the fields that are mm -hmm. in L2, such that their curl is in L2, their di uh, div divergence is in L2, because of that, and moreover, they have this boundary uh, boundary uh, condition relation mm -hmm. condition. Mm -hmm. So this is the the, uh, the the one one of the standard energy spaces. There are many energy spaces considered in uh, mathematical theory of electromagnetics. One of the most standard in th is this one. Okay, as I mentioned, under the assumption that we do about the C11 boundary, this same space takes this uh, form. So it is it is much nicer, let's say. So uh, because as, as as I said here, the initial definition, the definition for let's say not necessarily C11 boundaries, but Okay, for smooth but not C11 boundaries is this one. So we, we have fields in that are in L2 uh, with the curl mm -hmm. and the div in L2 and with the boundary condition this one. Now in the case of C11, this space becomes the space of fields in H1 uh, of uh, in H1 or all, all yeah, uh, but the, uh, what, with the what same is space condition. H without uh, super indices. H of omega. This is yes. the last force storm in this direct sum. What what is this space? It is some kernel or orthogonal orthogonal complement to some kernel. Is yes. it yes. is it is it smooth path or no non smooth path? No, but but here is our decomposition. The, the compo this uh -huh. one, huh? our the, the composition here is uh -huh. in fact the kernel, the, the functions in the kernel. So the solutions, yeah. let's say, in of, of the one problem, and what remains. Mm -hmm. So this is it, and and the, the solutions in the space. Uh, this first kernel is just h one zero omega, and the, the the remaining part are the functions that are in h one, but not in h one not, and uh, with the corresponding boundary condition. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 Thank you. Okay. Well, Sorry, we have. Uh, what is what is your main result? Sorry, can you yeah. explain in few words? Yes, yes. What is your main okay. result? Yeah. Right. The the main result are this uh, are these spectral representations. For example, uh, one of the main results is that one consider this space. T calligraphic H, which, as I said before, is more or less the same as the T. In, in the case of one half, is the same as T H mm -hmm. uh, half. Uh, we can uh, we can let's say uh, express it like that, like a, uh, like a series of uh, of uh, like like a series of uh, coefficients. And the U and gamma are the, the, the this are given by what is it? So so it is a kind of a spectral representation of the space. Okay, we, we represent the space in terms of uh, the spectrum of the corresponding operator that we introduced. And this is uh, useful in, in many cases, for example, because it's very hard in many problems to see, to find, let's say, the norm of the operator of the of the function in the HS norm by definition okay. of the HS. Sorry. Okay. Uh, and sorry. And the the, the last question. Uh, I missed the, the very beginning of your lecture. And uh, <coughs> this um, usually I was familiar with Calderon. Projection. So, uh, yeah. do you mean uh, under the Calderon operator the Calderon projection or something else? Okay, the, the Calderon operator uh, is. Let me show you the definition, and it is uh, certainly related to this kind. Uh, where is it? Uh, 
So if we consider Here it is. Right, so the, the, correspond the, the Calderon operator is the one that, if you consider this problem 1, 3, for example, is the, mm -hmm. the problem that maps this M, uh, M tilde, which is the, the, given, the given field on the boundary, it maps to the, to the to Ni cross H of this equation. So, if if one wants to to consider, for example, the the, the, the Maxwell system, one can first discuss the, the all this business for H for the field H, and then go back to to this equation and find the the the, the other field E as the curl of, of the H which has been studied so far. So. This kind of uh, so the, the interior Calderon operator is defined like that. It takes, let's say, uh, it takes here. This is M. Let's see it in in this level. It takes uh, the tangential part of the electric field, and it maps it on the tangential part of the magnetic field. Right. So this is what it does. It, it, it is, in a sense, it's the, the generalization of the uh, Dirichlet to Neumann map for the standard Laplacian. It takes, mm -hmm. let's say, Dirichlet data to Neumann data. Ah, uh, yeah. So this is uh, this is analog, just analog of Dirichlet to Neumann map in this uh, yes. uh, vector. Yes. It, vector is a, it is the Dirichlet to Neumann map in electromagnetic. Yeah, in this electromagnetic. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, are there any more questions? We saw Professor Aldonian had, had hand raised. Professor Aldonian, do you have a question? Maybe no. Okay. May I have just a very simple question? Mm -hmm. You mentioned um, you mentioned um, Laplace Beltrami operator and spherical yeah. harmonics, but also in your case when you treat the uh, um, model case of unisphere. Maybe you also use spherical harmonics for simplifying calculus or for presenting it in a yes. simpler manner. Mm -hmm. you, you do this. You do this thing also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. This is done in that paper I mentioned with uh, Christensen and Velander and Yanakopoulos. Uh, 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 if you want, I can I can send you the because now it yeah, is. Yeah, please do. This. Yes, I will be, because it is now uh, published, so I can send you the final form. Because you know uh, this model case is very, very nice to understand this. Subject, yes, you know? because because what we did there is that we found, let's say, we introduced this generalized harmonics, and in the case of the sphere, they uh, they are the same with the standard with the classical harmonic functions. So one can uh, use them, for example, uh, in different constructions. So I will, I will, so they, I will send you that. Say so they also connected with some kind of powers of your operator, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. You 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 can see the details in in that paper. Although I did not speak about this today, but they are similar. Okay. okay. Well, um, more questions, please. So. If you don't have more questions, we have a very nice conversation after the talk. Um, well, thank you, uh, Professor Stratis, uh, again for your uh, presentation. And if there are no more questions, then I would like to ask everyone who can do this to turn on your cameras and microphones, and we will thank Professor Stratis. Thank you very much. So again, I thank you very much for the invitation and for giving me the chance and opportunity to speak for such an uh, audience. So I'm really very glad I was with you today. And what else? Let's all.
be safe <laughs> under this trade. Yeah. Thanks to everyone for attending this seminar. Great to see you again, and until next seminar.